So welcome to Kinship Cafe. I am your host, Jim Jones. So glad you could join us today. And we are continuing our journey through the Tao Te Ching. And today we've made it to chapter 30. So we'll go ahead and share the screen here and we'll just jump right in. Starts off, whenever you advise rulers in the way of Tao, counsel them not to use force to conquer the universe. Now, this is the uh, Feng and English translation again. And here they're taking that uh, Tian Zia as universe, where normally it's like all under heaven or the world or sometimes even empire. Um, probably more appropriate to say the world in that sense here. And it continues with, for this would only cause resistance. So a couple of interesting things here. Uh, as we've noted in the past, uh, the Tao Te Ching frequently is engaging questions about governance, uh, about um, how do we you know, run the country, the context again being the warring states period when things were devolving into a fair amount of social chaos and the different philosophies that were being developed in China at this time, then we're all trying to address this question about how, how do we do this? How do we get out of this chaos and back to some kind of order? And they all had a, a particular idea on it. So here we see in particular this idea of advising a ruler. Uh, so the idea is that the sage has been enlisted to help uh, somebody understand, in particular, the way of Tao and how this might apply to, you know, ruling a state or ruling the country or whatever it may be. And here we saw last week the similar idea about not using force to try and conquer or improve the world. Uh, and we went through a pretty in-depth process of looking at kind of a hands-off approach to the environmental aspect, or at least recognizing how all the aspects of the environment are connected and how we need to respect those types of connections that when we try to get in and fix it or meddle with it, we end up ruining it. So here we've got a similar kind of uh, thought coming across into more of the social sphere. So previously it was the environment. Now we're talking about, you know, at a sociological perspective. And the council is don't use force, don't try to conquer. And it says, for this only causes resistance. Another way that this is translated is because it will come back to you or it will return or something along those lines. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause for just a second and, and see if you guys have some thoughts on this idea of not using force and the, the reason being about it uh, causing resistance or returning back to you. Yeah, this uh, actually makes me think of, uh, that's actually kind of a common thread I've been kind of picking up is uh the whole yin and yang type thing of you do one thing will cause another imbalance and so it kind of brings that thought to my mind of like if you're going to use force you're automatically going to get resistance in because of it existing and it might not necessarily be all that effective then either Yeah, a common theme that we've seen as well is the the imagery of the uncarved wood. And one of the ways that we've looked at that is the carving of the wood is kind of like, how do we get things to fit and, and conform to a particular shape that maybe isn't natural? And in doing so, I think that a lot of the Taoist critique of the current social situation was that the unrest is coming because there's an inherent resistance to trying to force people into particular modes of being. And of course, if we're talking about conquering, uh, we're talking about, you know, like at the level of 
warfare. And of course, that's going to have all kinds of resistance and the unexpected, or maybe maybe they could be foreseen, but seems like it's normally a surprise when you have a response or a retaliation from something like that when there really shouldn't be. I mean, obviously, if you're causing that kind of destruction or exercising that kind of force, you should expect that there's going to be consequences. Mm -hmm. So then it continues and it says, uh, thorn bushes spring up whenever the army has passed, wherever the army has passed, and lean years follow in the wake of a great war. What do you think this is getting at? There's more resistance. More. The resistance of the power of the force breeds more resistance down the road. If you go, if you just go down that path once, you'll continuously go on that path. So you're thinking more kind of like it becomes kind of a habit or a default reaction. I think it's 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 more that you show that you're not the right one, and if you obviously keep trying to squish it, it's gonna keep going. Ah. What do you think's happening when it says thorn bushes spring up? I'm seeing it as the resistance. Ah, so that became more metaphorical about how what that resistance looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm not expecting actual physical thorn bushes being referenced here. <laughs> well, have you seen what happens when large armies move into an area? What happens environmentally? Life gets suffocated there. Well, you can think just even from lots of people stomping around, you're going to be causing a lot of, you know, armies tend to be kind of larger. They come into an area that's not expecting them, and it's going to create a lot of disturbance whether we're just talking about simply the fact of the large amount of people being there and moving around and stomping around on things so let's say it was a grassy field now maybe that field's going to just be kind of smashed up um, you've somehow got to figure out how you're going to feed all these people and so you might be taking advantage of whatever's available in the area or maybe trying to uh, confiscate it from local inhabitants and uh then when they're gone, when they leave, what they leave behind tends to be kind of like this campground that's been trashed, right? And it's all that's left is the stuff that they they couldn't eat or use, right? These thorn bushes, it's just like, it's this imagery of, you know, they come in and it's just really destructive to the area. And all that's left is these thorn bushes. And in addition, it's saying that lean years follow if they've wiped out the gardens or the fields where people were planting food, they've taken it for themselves or destroyed it as they were battling, then it takes a while for those things to recover and for the ability to grow food to even come back. And it's quite devastating to the land. One of the symbols, and I hope I remember this correctly, but uh, of peace is the olive branch. And my understanding is that one of the reasons this became a symbol is because the olive trees were very susceptible to this kind of disruption. And it took many years for them to kind of recover and grow back. And so having an olive branch was a symbol that there had been peace in the land for many years. And this is a thing that I think we can recognize even in the wake of looking at current warring uh, that's going on in various places in the world, it leaves behind devastation. It just leaves behind the rubble. It leaves behind the thorns and the just the weeds, right? Uh, rebuilding, being able to get infrastructure back in place, being able to have food production back in place takes many years. It's, it's, there's a heavy cost that comes well beyond just the the battle itself but to the environment after something like that 
couldn't think of the word when uh, Martin jumped in, but pestilence is what I was thinking of. Mm. My brain on coffee works much better and much faster. And <laughs> I just the word wasn't coming to my mind. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting here then <clears throat> is the Dallas aren't saying exactly, you know, never fight under any circumstances. Uh, what we see is something a little bit more like if you have to fight, you have to fight, but it should be a last resort and only if necessary. And it shouldn't be something that you, you glory in. And if you're going to have to do something, just do what needs to be done and, and stop, right? Just, just what has to happen. Don't overgo. And so here we've got this idea of do what needs to be done never take advantage yeah. of power and there's going to be like, i'm sorry martin what's that sorry if you, if you go back a little bit uh that sounds almost like a cop out to me <laughs> because That's when you right. say just do just do what needs to be done like who decides if you if you are you know drunk with power a lot of things need to be done to keep you in power right so that's kind of like just justification for whatever you feel, not very sagey, if, uh, if I might say, um, in contrast of never taking advantage of power, kind of try to keep it, keep it in check. Um, this, this also makes me think of those who do not seek power are the most suited to wield it. Sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of those are gonna be things that come into play. I think in this context, we have not the person who actually is in power doing the counseling, right? This is the sage yeah. who's counseling the person who's in power. So the counsel is, you know, if it's a situation, and, and it's a <clears throat> always a very difficult question to answer that, when when is it justified? And I don't know that anybody's been able to come up with the perfect answer to that question. You definitely have people who are committed to nonviolence who would say that it's never justified. And you have others that are on the opposite extreme that, you know, uh, the best reaction to an aggression is overwhelming force to just completely uh, demoralize the opponent. So if there's no, uh, you know, the thought is that you don't want them coming back. And then you've got the in-between where it's like you use diplomacy, you do whatever you can, but at the end of the day, if there's something that needs to stop, if we need to, you know, even on a personal level, if I'm walking down the street and I see some guy trying to attack a woman, you know, I might put myself in harm's way and engage in violence to stop that particular event. But I'm not going to go and necessarily pummel the guy or seek out his family and figure out who his relatives are. So where we draw that line, nobody can actually tell us. And if we happen to be the person who's in control, the advice that's been given here is if it appears that it is necessary, don't go beyond what's necessary. Just deal with what you have to do and stop. Don't take advantage, even if you have the upper hand. I see what you mean. That reads differently now that you say yeah. that this way. Interesting. Yeah, it, but it is a challenging question for sure. Like, okay, what needs to be done, right? How do we, yeah. and, and there's always ways that we can justify that. And, and you're right. It's often uh, we are too easily justifying decisions that have far reaching consequences and are doing a lot with uh, violence where we would be better off without that, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Are we good then, Martin? Okay. Sure. I'm sorry, was somebody starting to say something? I was going to say Should that um, it seems to me that the um, um, message here is that you do not initiate the action, but rather react to a situation where you need to um, stop something from happening or um, 
basically maintain a situation rather than than go out and and initiate a an action. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely reads that it's much more in response to an aggression as opposed to initialize uh, initiating for sure. Yeah. So then there's going to be a couple of uh, statements that kind of reiterate this. So again, it's not a fully like pacifist or nonviolent uh, text as a whole. It's it's recognizing there might be a need for something. And the way that they uh, approach that then is to say, okay, achieve results, but never glory in them. Achieve results, but never boast. Achieve results, but never be proud. So looking at this as a very... Uh, in a very literal sense, like a necessary evil, right? Like it's not something to be proud of. It's not something to boast about. Uh, if you had to, you had to, but you shouldn't be taking this as something that is uh, going to be um, a good thing, right? So, sorry, Rob, I'm going to mute you again there. This makes me think about uh the large numbers of military soldiers marching we see them marching in china and we see them marching in russia and it's it's this is a statement that would say don't do that don't be proud about your military and then have them out there uh, showing in the in the glory about what they might be capable of so there's, we haven't got to it yet in the Dao Jing, but we'll see later that uh, if there are things like weapons, they, they aren't things that you want to have on display. Now, in a modern day situations, we often display our abilities um, as a deterrent. Uh, and this could be uh, thinking along those terms i'm not sure uh it, it, it's it's definitely at this point thinking about in terms of the proud and the boasting here is in regards to if you had to have engaged in some type of action you need to treat it as almost like a somber occasion <clears throat> like even if you were victorious people died and and that's not something to be taken lightly. Uh, and I think that's more the approach that they're looking at here, that you did what you had to do, but this isn't something to be excited about. This is something that, you know, it was, it, it, it got to this point because there was a failure in our ability to work things out or to be at peace or to negotiate or to, you know, solve whatever the difficulty was. And and it's not something to be proud of. It's this was a, a consequence of the last resort. In a more like modern tone, what keeps coming to mind for me is like you see videos on the internet all the time of someone being arrogant and just annoying or just rude or something and getting in someone's face, and the person tries to be, be calm and relaxed and tries to fix the situation and then the person just keeps going on and on and then they just like pop them in the face or something and then they walk away and I think that's what kind of keeps coming to mind for me is like the person tried to alleviate the situation calmly that didn't happen so they just did what they had to do knock the person out they didn't like say anything they didn't get in their face or like say yeah this is what you get or anything like that or hey look at my muscles and i just popped them in the face to stop the craziness and then walked away and like that's what keeps popping into my head for this type of conversation mm. yeah i'm thinking about the, the, the video games and the fact that so many times if you if you manage to destroy the enemy there's a 
huge celebration around it. And this would basically say, no, no, that's not the way you want to, that's not the way you want to react. Oh yeah. I mean, you can look even like historically, like uh, with Rome, uh, you know, they would take their prisoners and whoever and have a big parade with them. <laughs> right. And they would construct these big arches that they would march under uh, and they would become these monuments to particular battles a very famous one, I think, is in France, too. Um, you know, so it's it's definitely uh, a tactic that is used by uh, governments around the world and throughout history to glory in their victories, uh, to show their supremacy and why, you know, either their prowess or their God's prowess or whatever the thing is that they're fighting for was, you know, victorious over the others. Um you know, that that becomes then this reason for trying to demonstrate the rightness of their of their position. And um, yeah, this is definitely going in the face of a lot of that is basically saying, you know, violence is not something to glory in, even if you're victorious, it's a loss if it if he had to resort to violence in the first place. I want to, I kind of want to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, I kind of want to put this aside from physical violence as well, because to me, this seems to be applicable to any not so good activity or actions. For example, uh, my old company, Suncor, just did a massive rounds of layoffs and laid off over 2,500 people here in Calgary and in, in, in Canada. And then when the quarterly results came in, they have announced huge savings and their shares went up and they have increased the dividends on their, uh, on their, on their stock payouts. And that seems to me the sim very similar, very kind of similar behavior in terms of <clears throat> they did a lot of bad things to achieve the results and they kind of boasted about them by boosting their shareholders dividends even though it wasn't necessarily public yes we did laid off thousands of people but the consequences don't be hidden they're still there and the glory kind of was still in there so they sh they looked good to the shareholders and other other potential, potential investors right Sure. Yeah, there's there's lots of forms of conflict. And certainly one of the ways that the management worker relationship has been framed has been almost like in that adversarial way. Um, and and that there's you know a battle to be won in terms of how how you balance those things out. It's it's really getting to anything that is trying to again approach it by the use of force or taking advantage of power. So if we go back to, uh, hold on a second, the um, first part here, you know, if the sage is av advising rulers, and we could take that to be anybody who's in a position of power, whether it's more in an economic sense or a military sense or, or both, right? And it says that you counsel them not to use force to conquer. And that's a key thing because for the Taoists, it's a, it's always about trying to understand the the nature of things and moving forward in a way that shows harmony with the reality of what is, as opposed to trying to force what you want it to be. Uh, it, it really is a challenge to the idea of the shoulds. You know, it should be like this, and this is how you should act, and this is you know this idea of trying to control and conform and carve up and shape things is a general kind of theme that happens in a lot of different places wherever somebody finds themselves in a position of power and they're trying to enforce something. And the response here is that it's always going to end in resistance, whether you're talking about the relationship of employees to companies, or you're talking about citizens in a state, or where you're talking about, you know, states to state, um, any time that the approach is, you know, you're going to do this because I said so, and if you don't, you're going to get smacked over the head, that's not going to uh, ultimately work well uh, for anybody. 
Um, and, and here, thinking more specifically about actual war, they're talking about the kind of devastation that comes from that, that lasts well beyond the particular conflict. And here they're saying, we understand there might be a time and place where things are out of control and there's a, a momentary need to do something you'd rather not have to do, but the situation called for it. Don't go beyond what's needed, right? Don't take advantage of your position. And then again, this idea of the mindset, right? It's always a, a mark of failure if you had to resort to violence in the first place. And then there's a couple of more of these. Uh, achieve results because this is the natural way. So this is interesting. They're not saying that uh, the natural way of things is nonviolence. They'll see all kinds of uh, examples of, you know, creatures that eat other creatures or <laughs> defend themselves in whatever way they can, right? There's an interesting passage, I'll, I'll have to track it down, I believe it's in Zvanza, where it talks about horses, you know, they might kick at somebody who comes up and sneaks up behind them, but normally they're just going to eat their grass and run around and do what they want to do. But as soon as you start, you know, breeding them for war and putting the blinders on them, and now all of a sudden they're acting in unnatural ways. So they would see that there is a naturalness to this idea of self-defense, of being able to stop an aggression, of being able to protect, you know, a loved one or something along those lines. But how you do it, right? The horse doesn't go on a rampage. It just takes care of, of whoever came up behind it. And then it just goes back to eating its grass, <laughs> you know? And that's kind of what they're looking at is don't do beyond and don't take advantage, right? It, it, there's, there's a naturalness to it, but that naturalness is not like this rampaging revenge uh, type of a move. It's do what you have to do. And then... The final one here, it says achieve results, but not through violence. And I think this could be looked at in a couple of different ways. One, always we're striving to accomplish the de-escalation or resolving the conflict before it arises to violence. But then I think violence might be looked at, if we compare this with the previous statement, because this is natural. So if we think about, again, the example of the horse kicking, um, we might not call that violence. We might call that just, you know, a, a, an instinctual response to something. But if we are intentionally designing something to attack, maybe that's more along the lines of what they're thinking of with violence, that it's not simply a natural self-defense, but it's going beyond that. I don't know for sure that that's the case, but that's just in thinking about these two lines kind of in connection with each other, because they almost seem like they're saying the opposite thing, right? Everything above was about achieving results, this idea of this limited use of violence just for, you know, meeting the immediate need but not going beyond. And then this last one, you know, where it's saying, but not through violence. Maybe the wordplay here is, yes, everything apart from violence, but then if it resorts to having to do something, maybe they're seeing a difference between a natural reaction and the idea of violence. I don't know. Does anybody have any other thoughts on that? Find this... As a as a pacifist myself, never never been the one to get into fights, um, unless you know receiving them. Um, but I I feel that there is a there's a point where you can take a certain uh, approach, try to not do violence. But when someone else does not take the same and then starts to you know get in your face, and as as Chaz mentioned earlier, um, at some point it's just you cannot just give keep giving in and trying to give give your own give give up parts of you or parts of what makes you uh just because someone else d demands it and at some point violence for people is the ultimate force right at the end of the day no amount of diplomacy may be able to resolve your 
the oppression and i i think that that's that, that's a lot of a lot of that in terms of the others pushing with violence others being unable to defend themselves with violence is source of a lot of our world conflicts and uh not only uh not only in the in between countries world but also between i look at with the racism in america i right? look, look at racism around the world that between classes i would say i mean that, that i think that's that's a lot of the a lot of the we see lately as well hmm. yeah i think if anything the ambiguity of these two lines in contrast to each other shows that this isn't anything easy to sort out <laughs> it is a, a challenging thing for um anybody and the best that we can hope for is that in the moment if we find ourselves in that situation that we will uh do what we have to do but but no more i think is really at the core of where they're trying to get at with this idea Then there's a kind of a conclusion, kind of a therefore. It says, force is followed by loss of strength. This is not the way of Tao. So Tao is interesting because it's these patterns, right? And the idea is that these patterns are like, if we're getting to the goal of the constant patterns, they're the things that are cyclical that keep happening that they return uh, over and over again um we definitely have like the movement back and forth from yin and yang but we also have like the the cycles of the things like the seasons and so when we're looking at something like force i think the idea that they're saying is there's an unnatural movement uh in order to affect change in some way that isn't sustainable it's not an ongoing cyclical uh well again sustainable way of doing things and it results in you know yes there was a change but then there's this consequence and the consequence they're saying is loss now whether they mean loss in terms of up above the the fields being destroyed and the food production system being destroyed or loss in the sense of um you know it it took something away from you in order to accomplish this and then there's going to be maybe not a complete return to the way things were it's a disruption so their goal is always how do we stay in that sustainable balance and that harmony with this type of use of force you're going outside of that and there's a consequence to that and it's it's a loss of some kind in this case they say you know strength and then it's concludes with that which goes against the Tao, <clears throat> goes against these patterns, the way things function in the universe, is going to come to an early end. It's not going to have its, it's not going to live out its natural course because there's going to be consequences for disruption, disrupting the system in this way. And I think that's really kind of the core of where they're trying to go with why these things matter is ultimately you buck the system you go against that way of nature ultimately it's it doesn't end well for you <laughs> and that's kind of the bottom line of where they go with everything it's right it's like the more we can be in that natural balance and harmony it's just going to be better for everybody i did find it kind of interesting that these chapters were coming up uh, at the time where we're dealing with a couple of uh, significant stages of violence in our world. Um, can be tricky to engage in these conversations when there's a lot of tensions on both sides of the arguments on these battles that are happening. Um, without uh, trying to go too far down that road of the specifics in the current events um does how what's being presented here give you any thoughts about 
current events? Um, I'll bring up about Russia and Ukraine because it's a little bit less sting of a sting point since it's been kind of ongoing for a while. Um, I kind of see that relation in some of this stuff. If you look at Russia, they have used a lot of force. They have lost a lot of strength because of that force. And, and then you look at Ukraine and they were literally just doing what needed to be done. They are literally just responding to get back their land and whatever they need to do to help their people. They're not trying to do more than that. You know, they're not trying to push Russia back and take all of Russia or anything like that. You know, that so I kind of see that kind of balance in play for that. As for the other stuff, I haven't really kept in tabs of what's going on there. I've kind of intentionally not taken part of that one um, for personal reasons, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I'm kind of seeing this stuff kind of flow and be true with the other uh, Russia side of things. <laughs> yeah. See that? Um, I have this all of this makes me wonder more about how achievable, how attainable this is. Like how likely is it that we're all gonna be kumbaya and happy and kind of to one another without conflicts or with, without violence or like where is the where is the limit as to where people can be? without violence and as, as the human nature, I guess, as I think the dog talks about like the action and reaction, right? So if too much peace breeds violence, too much violence breeds peace and vice versa. And like, you know, all the opportunities that we are created by, for those who, you know, when there's a complete peace and power vacuum almost that others typically would, would just rise to the power and seize it for themselves because nobody is there to oppose them perhaps how how it's more of a cycle back and forth up and down that's just going to come around pendulum if, the, if there is too much peace there's going to be more war if there's too much war there is going to be an inevitable peace because we run out of resources we run out of strength we run out of out of the power to go we keep going yeah how how do how does that kind of represent how is that represented in all the all the conflicts that we have and whether it's as i said before whether it's the in, in between in between countries conflicts or within between classes conflicts and between generations conflicts yeah too meta, too meta today <laughs> There's definitely no end to conflict in our world. Um, and it is interesting. Um, just looking at how things shift even over the course of my lifetime in terms of different political ways of looking at things. And um, It, 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 it's going to continue to be in a flow. But I think the question about is this practical or is this something that could ever happen is an interesting question uh, because I think the worldview that the this Dallas perspective is coming from is a, a carryover from more of an indigenous way of looking at things. Like I've mentioned before, this kind of paleolithic worldview in which there were smaller groups uh, and not larger groups. And there's always disagreement when you get into sociologists and anthropologists about, you know, what were the different ways that humans organized themselves and were they more or less 
violent in prior times. And it, it, there's obviously evidence of wars or at least violent uh, deaths for humans prior to uh, the age of agriculture. So during that hunter-gatherer time, there, it's not that it was a time that was free of violence. But what is interesting is what a number of anthropologists and sociologists have come to the conclusion that there was a way of of structuring how humans did their societies that avoided the uh, ability for there to be the strong man that was in control, uh, that tended to be more egalitarian in terms of how the groups were organized. So our two closest ancestors are the chimpanzees and the bonobos, and they have very different ways that they approach their social structures. The chimpanzees definitely have more of the strong man, and they definitely have more of the violence that they use for how they uh, keep order in their, I don't know if they call them tribes or herds or <laughs> whatever it is for monkeys. Um, but the bonobos, very different, right? When they get into conflict, everybody starts having sex. Uh, and it's like, that's the way that they kind of like chill everything out. Um, and so we're kind of somewhere you know, between the two, but it seems that when we were in that hunter-gatherer stage, there was a way of socially being structured that prevented somebody from getting a big head, of standing up, of uh, allowing somebody to kind of become the strong man. It wasn't until we had kind of a massive shift sociologically uh, in terms of becoming more settled, and again, how this agrarian uh, way of living took over that encouraged a different type of human behavior that allowed or was more in favor of that strong man coming into positions of power uh, in order to do things like defend and uh, maintain uh, certain ways of being. So I think that's where we have to kind of think about in our current social structures if we wanted to get to more of an egalitarian way of, of engaging with each other, and this doesn't mean that everything is equal, there's obvious differences between people and different strengths and, and abilities that need to be taken in, um, into consideration. But in terms of this overall kind of hierarchy, we have created systems that really foster the kinds of behaviors that we don't like in terms of that strong man, in terms of the ability for somebody to um, that maybe has more psychopathic tendencies, which is in a surprisingly large percentage of the population. I forget the exact number. There's an interesting book. It's called The Sociopath Next Door or something like that. Uh, interesting read, but also a little bit disturbing. Uh, but different types of cultures tend to enable people with those traits to rise to positions of power more than other types of cultures. Cultures that tended to be more collectivistic and thinking about the community first as opposed to the individual have the same number of sociopaths, but they don't emerge in the same way as cultures that tend to be more individualistically oriented. And that just seems to be like a breeding ground for antisocial behavior. So, there's, I think the larger question is thinking about how do we structure our world or at least our societies so that it is keeping more of those checks and balances in place. And, and certainly with democracies, we're trying to do things along those lines. Um, we've made some mistakes in terms of doing things like letting money into the process. Uh, that has created a definite challenge to the goals that democracy was trying to achieve. Um, so I think it's just going to be a continuation of this trying to find the better ways to uh, organize how we live together to encourage more of the traits that we're after. And I think that the benefit of something like the Tao Te Ching is it helps us to see things uh, to get at where some of these root causes lie uh, if we're going to try and 
correctly diagnose the situation of modern existence and, and where we might want to go with it in the future. That would be my take on it. It's not a quick answer. <laughs> and it doesn't like solve the problem, obviously, overnight. But I think that's I think that's the only way it can go. And unfortunately, because of the vested interest of the powers that be, um, you know, it may take time. And fortunately, humans don't live that long. So there's a lot of the growth happens when, in a very literal sense, the old guard dies off and the next generation with the newer ideas is able to rise to ascendancy. So I think we're definitely seeing a bit more of a struggle with that right now, at least in American politics. It's interesting to see how vigorously the old guard is holding on to the position well into their old age in a way that I don't recall happening before. Um, and I think that part of that is that there is a definite <laughs> awareness of how radically things are probably going to change once the up and coming generation is in a position to uh, be doing things. And um, it's definitely a power struggle right now. Just let the millennials take over already, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Pass the torch to us. We were ready. <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> I don't know if this is true because I'm not, I am a millennial and I am not another generation, but I feel like millennials just love each other so much. Like millennials love millennials and they love Gen Z and they're just ready for this. <laughs> and that makes me happy. <laughs> I think that there's, this is exactly what, you know, this kind of peace and quiet and happy times with is what exactly what this breeds the conflicts that will come after us. Like, we'll find our own ways to burn the world down. Uh, maybe not immediately, but sure. maybe by the consequences of not burning it down, someone's going to find a way, oh, I wish I could burn something down. You can burn anything <laughs> down in a while. Let's do it. <laughs> it's been a while. It's time. <laughs> Don't burn something down. Yeah. It makes me think of a quote I've heard before where it said, war breeds strong people. Strong people create peace. And then peace uh, breeds weak people. And weak people create wars. Oh. So there's like a never-ending loop to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing we have to remember is that all of the stuff that we're experiencing is just a blip in terms of the total history of of humans. So there's lots of different ways that um, things can be. Uh, we just have to figure out what's really important. And that's going to guide more of what we do. And I think we know more now about the consequences of mucking with environmental things, mucking with social things, and uh, the kinds of consequences that can come from that. I was going to offer a comment, Jim, if I could. Um, Please. In, in terms of war, you know, one of the uh, counterintuitive and unlikely things is that, generally speaking, people who are in the military for a living are the least likely to want war. It almost went back to Robert E. Lee's comment. He says, it's a good thing that war is so awful, or we would love it too much. And I think of uh, even our uh, some of our foolish engagements, you know, like Iraq. Uh, you know, you had the military leadership, Powell, saying, you know, if you break it, you own it. You're discouraging the whole thing. And it was people who never served in any really legitimate way, civilians that never really wore a uniform or marginally wore a uniform who were gung-ho to uh, launch these wars, not realizing the horror in front of them and the, uh, un un and the unintended and unanticipated consequences of it. Yeah. Yeah, those are good points. Um, you know, I, my own history, I have 
had kind of two twin seemingly incompatible ways of being where I've thoroughly enjoyed being involved in martial arts. But for a significant portion of my life, I was extremely committed to uh, the path of nonviolence. And in a certain sense, I found that the martial arts actually kind of work the way you're talking, Rob, of by being aware of how devastating violence can be, even accidental violence, and why it's so important to avoid it at, at, at all cost. Um, really, uh, it was kind of a weird balancing act that would happen between those two ideas. Uh, yeah, I think there's something to that. Well, we're just about at our time. Uh, I know this was got a lot of stuff to chew on in this one. Um, I'll just kind of give the last couple of minutes if anybody had some parting words they wanted to uh, engage with. I want to say, Jim, thank you so much for keeping us, keep on keeping doing this and keeping us coming together and having those conversations. I think this is very meaningful and it's societally meaningful for us to engage in those conversations and continue to think about those things for our future and how do we how do we do our how do we do the future so thank you for doing this i really I really appreciate you well it's my pleasure i i i definitely enjoy these kinds of conversations and they wouldn't be possible if i didn't have people like you that came together to have them so it goes both ways <laughs> you're welcome yeah <laughs> well uh why don't we then we'll bring it to a close and i'll just say if you're watching this as a video and you'd like to be a part of this conversation you can register your email at www.kinship.cafe and uh, you'll get links to the zoom presentation on friday mornings as well as the in person if you happen to be in southern california area and we'd love to see you then. So take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Jim.